The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you inspired your servant Luke the physician to reveal in his gospel the love and healing power of your Son. Give to your church the same love and power to heal, to the glory of your name, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Zion. The first reading is from the 43rd chapter of Isaiah, beginning at the 8th verse. Bring out the people who are blind, yet have eyes, who are deaf, yet have ears. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right and let them hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me, there is no savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Also, henceforth I am he. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? Here ends the reading. Please join in responsibly reading Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let, now, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was at our side when people rose up against us. Then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. The second reading is from the fourth chapter of Second Timothy, beginning at the fifth verse. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do your best to come to me soon. For Damas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Here ends the reading. <laughs> The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, beginning in the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Inasmuch as I have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you might may have certainty 
concerning the things you have been taught. And, toward, and, and then continuing onward, then he said, Jesus said to them in chapter 24, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried into heaven. They worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. I invite the young and young at heart to attend the children's message from Luther Bear here today. Oh, you heard a very long and interesting name that Luke, the gospel writer, was writing to somebody named Theophilus. Theophilus, and you want to know about that. Well, guess what? A lot of people want to know about that <laughs> um, because there are some different ideas about who this Theophilus is. Some scholars think it was a wealthy patron helping Luke travel and get the information for his gospel and the book of Acts. But there's something very did you know that this was not written in English? It was written in Greek. And in Greek, Theophilus means friend of God. So Luke is actually writing this to you and me and everybody who is a friend of God that we might be reminded and know everything that God the Father has done for us through his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I don't think you should tell your teacher that your new name is Theophilus, but uh, you can think about yourself as a friend of God, and isn't it wonderful how the writing of the Bible is really to you and me and all who are following Jesus. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, throughout um, years, there has been a captivating sense in books and television and play of 
the courtroom drama. What is going to happen in that courtroom? And you've got a judge and you've got the jury, but most importantly, you have witnesses and people who are testifying about what happened. Um, so I, I grew up with my parents showing me some Perry Mason, and I've even read some of the books, and uh, I more maybe know about law and order um, and the courtroom scenes there, so always high drama. So uh, guess what? Our setting in Isaiah is precisely a courtroom drama. And there's some problems with the witnesses. Um, so God's people, Israel, are there. And they know, they've experienced, and they know from their history books and scripture what God has done for them. But they seem to be doubting that in their present circumstances. And then not just God's people, but all the nations are gathered and they may or may not be familiar with what God the Almighty has done. And so who is testifying today? Why God himself to set the record straight. And he says, you are my witnesses, and I am here to state again who I have been from the beginning. There was no God before me, and there is none that comes afterwards. And a reminder also that he is the one through whom all came to being when we hear those words, nothing before our God. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you and you are my witnesses and I am God. A very stark reminder about I am the one, remember, who delivered you out of the bondage of slavery in Egypt and kept you in the wanderings for years and years in the wilderness until you reached the land that had been set for you. And even when you turned from me and when you were no longer there, I never abandoned you. And I was faithful even when you were not. And going forward, the Lord God reminds you, I am he. There is none that can take you from the protection of my hand. I work, who's going to take it back? Powerful, powerful testimony from our God, the Father. And we know that he fulfilled the promise of ultimate salvation for his people as we hear in John's gospel, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And we know that through our Savior Jesus Christ, dying for our sins on the cross, and then rising again in victory at the resurrection, that we are re reconciled and forgiven to our Father God, and we have the hope and assurance of life to come with him. This is the ultimate healing for all that ails us, but it is not yet complete until our Savior comes again. And so we experience the challenges, the disappointments, the struggles, the pain, the illness of this broken world. But the difference is that peace and love of God in Christ 
that nothing can take away from us, that we will never be snatched out of our Lord's loving arms. We hear in the psalm today, if the Lord had not been on our side when our enemies attacked us, they would have swallowed us alive. The Lord's help, writes one scholar, does not mean that we shall not experience suffering, but that we shall emerge better on the other side of it. For if God is for us, who can be against us? Many may be, but they will not prevail any more than they ultimately prevailed over Jesus, who rose victorious, defeating sin, death, and the devil. But I wanted to look further at another psalm verse. Do not cast me off in my old age. Do not forsake me when my strength is completely spent. From Psalm 71, verse 9. And again, the same scholar who commented earlier, we throw away many items when they are no longer useful to us. To God, we are not disposable. He created each of us with an immortal soul. As we age, we can be thoughtful and kind even when our bodies are less able. And when we are too old even for this, we can devote ourselves to ceaseless prayer. And the prayer he offers is, Father, teach me to age well, that is, in your will and grace. And today, as we lift up the healing ministry of the church, I would argue that those words apply not just to aging, but to all those times when we suffer physically, regardless of our age, and sense the weakness and frailty of our human bodies. And we also know that there are two ways we come to encounter our Lord ultimately. When he comes again, or when we die and rest in his arms. And sometimes in our day and age, we do not talk enough about preparing for that time to rest in the Lord. Luke, the physician, realized that there was an ultimate healing that God the Father provided in our Lord Jesus Christ that would bring us peace and comfort in the struggles of this life in our faulty bodies as they are, but more importantly, gave us hope and light for the future, even while our bodies or things around us may be wasting away. And that there is always something to look forward to for those of us who are in the faith, in the family of Christ Jesus. There is a book that's been written, and I may have uh, mentioned it before, by John Wyatt uh, called Dying Well. And he is an emeritus professor at the National Pediatrics University at the College of London, which means he had been serving as a physician to children that were experiencing their own issues of pain and suffering alongside of their family. But this man is also a very devout Christian and is encouraging us in this book to realize truly in our process of dying the gateway to eternal life. And he shows, gives the following example. Rico Tice pastor evangelist at All Souls, All Souls Church, Langham Place, London, told me how, as a very inexperienced and junior pastor, he visited our mutual friend, Stuart, who was dying from advanced lymphoma. Stuart was a quiet and rather reserved person in his 30s, a professional musician who, until the cancer was diagnosed, 
had immersed himself in academic studies. But as he came to terms with his imminent death, he discovered new strength and spiritual vitality in the Christian hope. As Rico walked into Stuart's room, he blurted out the first thing that came into his head. So, Stuart, what's it like to be dying? Stuart gave him a look. Rico, Christ is risen. You may think the cross is precious to you, but think what it means to me. I'm going to be standing before him in a few days' time. In the second letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul uses an analogy of an earthen clay pot, the type that was often used to store and hide treasure in the ancient world. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. And Wyatt goes on to write, one of the profound spiritual lessons that dying has to teach us is to learn to see beyond the superficial appearance of our humanity and to recognize the spiritual reality and beauty that lie beneath. In death, the gateway to eternal life. And so on this Sunday, we recognize that because Luke, with a medical background, physical medical background, came to know the ultimate healing that our God has brought to us through our Savior Jesus Christ, he took it upon himself to research and write that gospel to the friend of Jesus, a friend of God, Theophilus, that we may be assured of what we believe in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the fulfillment of what had been written in the law and prophets, and that we may be assured that because our Savior lives, we shall live also. And to return to the courtroom drama, guess what our role is? We are all witnesses, that we can go forth and testify to all that God has done for us. And I would argue that a number of our testimonies come not from times when our lives were smooth sailing, but times when Jesus shepherded us through stormy waters that we knew there was hope and life on the other side, as there always is in our Lord. And may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.